Hi, everyone. Welcome to our conversation on sustainable fashion with Maxine Beda. Um, my name is Kate Nordstrom. I'm the executive and artistic director of the Great Northern uh, Festival that is now in its final weekend. Um, every year, the Great Northern shares dozens of performances and art installations, outdoor activations, and solutions-focused climate talks for 10 days at the end of January and beginning of February. And we hope this activity really invigorates the mind and the body each year in the darkest, coldest part of our winter. So this conversation is part of our climate solutions series. Uh, and that culminates this Sunday at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. So there's one more talk that we'd love for you to attend. So we would like to take this opportunity to thank some sponsors, particularly the McKnight Foundation, the Minneapolis Foundation, and Greater MSP, also DEED, for their support of the climate series in particular. We want to thank the Minneapolis Club for having us here and for being a sponsor of the Great Northern. Uh, and if you want to support the work that we do, we would love for you to consider that too. And you can make donations on our website, greatnorthernfestival.com. So I just want to share a few words about Maxine and um, the work that she has done, and then I'll turn things over. So. Maxine Beda is the founder and director of the New Standard Institute, a think tank, think and do tank, using data to drive accountability in industry. She is also the author of the book Unraveled, The Life and Death of a Garment. Prior to NSI, New Standard Institute, she co-founded and was CEO of Zadi, a fashion brand and lifestyle destination creating a transparent and sustainable future for the apparel industry. Bida has been recognized by Oprah uh, and her Super Soul 100, and for um, she's a leader in elevating humanity. So she now lives here in Minneapolis with her husband and daughter. We're really, really lucky to have her part of our community. It's awesome to see such a full room. I know that the subject matter is really of interest to so many of us. We want to learn and do better. Um, so thank you for that. Um, please join me in welcoming Maxine. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. I, I'm going to try without the microphone. Can you hear me, though? OK. And if I stop projecting, say I can't hear you, and I will project again. Um, but I'm so happy um, to be here. Um, as Kate said, I. We're thrilled my husband is right here. Um, we just moved back in November um, and just really thrilled to be part of this community again after 20 years. Um, and I'm thrilled to be a part of the, the Great Northern Festival and um, talk to you about um, issues that I really care about and I'm grateful that you are here today. Um, so I'm, the, the title, um, starting provocatively, <laughs> um, is There's No Such Thing as Sustainable Fashion. And what I just wanted to spend the time doing in this um, time that we have together is really just walking through the process of how a garment is created, um, because that's the way in which to understand the impacts that a garment has and leads us to how we can make solutions. Um, so that's really what I wanted to do. And then along the way of kind of going through this process of how a garment is produced, also just um, highlighting, I call it, well, it's listed there as green washing, but I think sometimes the better explanation is green wishing. But sometimes um, companies, people want these things to be true, but I'll just kind of give you the data that is sometimes not what we want it to be, but it is what it is and we need to understand it in order to be able to address these situations. So with that, I will skip over, we already know what the New Standard Institute is, but I think just kind of before, it's so nice to see audiences that care about this. And what's so great as somebody who's been now in this industry for about 10 years, um, is to see how people are really understanding that apparel and fashion has an enormous impact. Because for a long time it was really dismissed as an inconsequential industry, but it's a two and a half trillion dollar industry. It's one of the leading 
global employers of women around the world. Um, it has an enormous footprint because of just how many pieces are produced. Over 100 million pieces um, of garments are produced every year. It's hard to get real like concrete data on that, but that's kind of a, um, a universal figure. Um, and then one country produces enough textiles to go around the world more than 1,219 times. And what I didn't say there is that's every year. So it's just, just the scale of it. I mean, it's, like, it's hard to kind of wrap one's head around that. Um, and it has an enormous climate impact. Um, again, hard to find um, peer-reviewed uh, kind of consensus around these figures, but um, the leading kind of report on that is suggesting that the fashion industry is responsible for 8.1% of total global greenhouse gas emissions. And as the industry kind of moves towards more disposability, that number will just increase. So it's, it matters. <laughs> um, so I just, this, we're going to very quickly <laughs> run through all of these things. Just get a sense as we hopefully walk out of this room knowing kind of how a garment um, comes to be, our relationship to it, um, where it goes when we're done with it, um, and what we can do going forward. Okay. So, as the title of the, of the presentation um, suggests, something just that has become part of the vocabulary around sustainability is this idea of sustainable fashion. And we push back on this idea that there is even such a thing as sustainable fashion because we're not growing trees. Every time we produce a garment, it's going to have an impact of some kind. And, and the, the problem of this language of sustainable fashion is that it really moves, moves the conversation away from what is my relationship to the garment, how often, how, how many times am I actually going to be wearing it, to, oh, I just have to buy the sustainable thing, this thing like labeled sustainable, and not this other thing. Um, and I think really we need to start at that point, is reorienting our relationship with clothing because it's become such a disposable one. And I think, you know, back to when I first lived here, <laughs> um, growing up, like when we would do our go, going back to school shopping, like that was the one time, right, that we were really investing and really having to think about the purchases we made because they were expensive. Um, and now as that, you know, some, some part of the industry has moved in this direction, we don't have that relationship anymore and it just becomes like just very disposable. So that's the, the first thing is um, this language of sustainable fashion is something we have to, to move away from. Okay, now jumping into the actual making of the garment. Um, so clothing, we're going to start at the farm. Um, really, in reality, if we're thinking about the average garment today, we would be starting in an oil rig because the, the majority of fibers going into our clothing today um, are polyester, um, fossil fuel-based fibers. Um, but we're going to start thinking about kind of the origin of where that fiber is coming from. And you can see here, um, this is the, the energy use, sorry, there's going to be a couple of charts here, um, the energy use for just the fiber creation stage. And you can see already here that we're beginning to make decisions as you're choosing a fiber of the energy use and therefore the climate impact that each of these fibers have. And just, I want you to focus in on um, polyester and on cotton for a second as we turn to this next um, chart. So this is the rise of polyester. Um, 2000 is about when I left Minneapolis, <laughs> um, and 2020 is um, when I'm coming back. Um, and just how the world has completely changed in how our clothing is produced. So forever, it was coming from a farm, and now it's really taking off and coming from um, a, a, a fossil fuel-based fiber that is Polyester is a plastic, so also contributing to microplastic pollution. Okay, in thinking about fiber, and there's a lot to cover in 30 minutes, and I, um, <laughs> um, but it, it is so crucial to understand the intersection of our clothing with the 
history of the, this country with slavery and also mapping kind of uh, modern day slavery today because some of those maps and the maps of colonialization map pretty perfectly to our clothing trade today. So it's not something um, that's a whole entire coursework, but I really encourage people um, to uh, learn more about it. And there's a, a wonderful organization called Intersectional Environmentalists that um, does a really good job of talking about these issues and uncovering them. And it's really important to understand how these things um, intersect. So um, please, everybody take note of Intersectional Environmentalists. <clears throat> OK. Now, just, this is a washing out the green washing or the green wishing. So just some things to dispel. Um, and it all kind of goes back to this not, there's no such thing as sustainable fashion. And it doesn't mean that there isn't, there aren't companies represented in this room that aren't doing really important serious work, not to diminish that at all. It's that we have to just understand really what it is that we're doing um, when we are doing sustainability. Um, so, um, Oftentimes we see clothing labeled as organic, and in, in, in those brands, um, you know, people are saying, like, it's organic, so it's sustainable. Organic is a standard that represents just the fiber. So you can have, an, and uh, what it means is that there are no synthetic chemicals used in the production of that fiber. As we will see, fiber is the first stage of a very long process. So if you are using organic cotton, but you don't care about what is the rest of your supply chain that we are about to describe, um, it's, it's not, like, it cannot be equated with being sustainable. It can, it's an important step in the right direction. Um, it's better than a thing that isn't that. Um, but again, it's more about that relationship to our clothing and whether we like that product and really want to wear that product um, more. I'm still speaking loud enough, right? Loud enough. <clears throat> okay, another thing just in the fiber space to dispel um, is that, um, and uh, Matthew gets, Matthew right here gets credit for this uh, beautiful design, <laughs> um, recycled polyester, which is when we talk about the, the fabric made from um, recycled bottles. This is another thing that like, um, we want this to be a good thing, but there are some challenges with the reality of what's happening on the ground. So the, the, the hard thing to understand, or the thing to understand, is when we have um, our plastic bottles, a plastic bottle that goes, if we put it in the recycling bin, and, we re and it then goes into the recycling stream, if the beverage industry picks that up and take, makes that into another bottle, it can be turned into another bottle again. Okay, so that's like, when we think of closed loop, it's a fairly closed loop system plastic bottle, recycled, can become a plastic bottle again, more or less. In the fashion side of things, if we take a plastic bottle and we turn it into a garment, there isn't a solution currently at scale to be able to turn that garment into anything. So, and what's happening on the back end, on the business end of the recycling industry, is there's actually not enough plastic bottles that we recycle to go around. And so the beverage industry is right now competing with the apparel industry on this raw material. Um, and so we think, oh, this is great. We're using recycled polyester with, you know, 10 bottles have gone into this thing. Um, but it's not, it's a bit more of a complicated um, journey than that. Um, and and this, this is why we got to really have to understand the root causes of this. Um, if we want to tackle the the, the plastic pollution problem. We have to reduce how much plastic is being produced. Um, and, and we either have to reduce how much is being produced or we have to recycle, you know, choose recycling a whole lot more. And we're, those numbers, our recycling rates are is just not going up very much. Okay, second unit. Now we've covered everything with fibers. <laughs> um, now we're turning, we have our fiber, it's either polyester fiber or cotton fiber. It's, I think cotton is, at least people understand like what that is. Cotton fiber, it's gone through the gin, it's grown, it's been gin. It's going now to um, a, a textile facility, a spinner, okay? Um, this is the steps to create yarn. You're gonna open, those, open that fiber 
you're going to blend the fiber so there, it's not like one bale, the bales get mixed together or it gets mixed with other fibers. You're going to clean it, I won't, I, this will be boring. You're going to clean it, bat it, card it, draw it, comb it, robe it, spin it. Okay, the, the point of the matter is, um, and at the end of the spinning you get what we call yarn. Then, once we have yarn, we have to weave or knit it, size it, scour it, bleach it, mercerize it, dye it, and finish it. The point of all of this, all of these steps, like, I want, if you can, go in your mind's eye, most of this is happening in China, go in your mind's eye, we've grown our bale of cotton in Texas, that bale is going to get shipped to China, and this is happening in one or two or three very large facilities. And all of these steps, take enormous amounts of energy. And they take enormous amounts of energy and we're in places like China that have a coal-based energy grid. Coal energy is some of the most um, energy, uh, uh, carbon impactful um, sources of energy, which is why when you add up the, the amount of steps, the amount of energy required in the steps, the energy source we are using for those steps, our disposable relationship to our clothing and those steps. That's why this industry is having so much um, impact when it comes to climate and the environment and people. Okay, so this is getting technical, but it really matters. 76% <laughs> of the carbon footprint of clothing is in this phase. So that's why when you think about like, oh, it's organic cotton, therefore it's sustainable on a climate matter, the organic, the organic cotton didn't actually matter that much in the grand scheme of things. If you are using the most beautiful regenerative cotton ever, it has zero impact, but then you go use a mill um, that is running off of, of coal um, and you're, you're purchasing something that you're not wearing much, you're not, really, you're not doing anything. Okay, so in this, um, the yarn to textile phase, this is also where uh, most of the chemical application is. I think I have a picture of this. Yeah. This is a picture I took um, in, um, in visiting different um, textile cities in China. Um, and I wish I could, like, take, so, as we're walking along, we just did the tour of a textile mill, and this is the back. <laughs> um, this is not part of the official tour, I should have you know. Um, and we're walking along and you just hear this like gurgling noise. <clears throat> and as you can kind of see that like this part, right, is not, it's not like our blue lakes. Um, it's already very gray and uh, it smelled and it burned my nose and I was pregnant at the time of this picture. My child's fine, I think. <laughs> um, um, but you could just see this black, um, this black stuff, these black effluents that were coming out of the, directly from the factory that we had just visited. And um, what you don't see here is that as you walk along, walked along here and kind of on that side was all um, agricultural plots. So people were using, and then you saw the vegetables that were being sold in the markets from those, um, those agricultural plots. So it's not only chemicals that are being mismanaged and impacting the workers in those facilities, it impacts the communities that then farm and fish. Um, many of those uh, rivers are dead, so, but like farm. Um, and then they remain on our clothing um, as well. They're not all washed out. So um, it's a big challenge because, um, again, this is not a universal. There are some great players. <laughs> Um, but there, the, a, an overall challenge in the industry is, is um, companies not knowing where even this textile, their textile production is. Um, and that's why this sort of lack of regulation. Okay, this is just another green wishing thing. Sustainably sourced materials, like these sort of generalized words, don't really mean anything. Like we have to actually understand and get into what is the impact. Where is that impact being reduced? In what way? To what degree? Um, and then we can start talking about sustainably sourced. Okay, we've covered super fast. Um, we've covered fiber. We now have that fiber has been spun, dyed, finished. It's a fabric. Um, that fabric is now going to get cut and sewn somewhere else. 
So if we're taking like a um, traditional like fast fashion, a piece of Zara clothing, let's say, um, that fabric that was uh, woven in China is going to get shipped to Bangladesh. Um, and what's really important, this is a um, picture I uh, took in Ghazipur, Bangladesh, which is a big, um, outside of Dhaka, a big manufacturing hub for Bangladesh, um, is that there are lots of people. In the, in the textile world, you don't see that many people. It's a pretty automated process, um, especially in places like China that are so developed on that front. But we still have, we have not automated um, apparel production. And I think it's worth, even though we're racing through all of this, is to take a second and like look at what you're wearing right now and just notice like seams. And like, mine, does that have fault with? Not really. Uh, but there are seams, like this was a pretty complicated structure, um, and a belt loop, and your buttonhole, and your hem, like all of these things are each individually done on a sewing machine. We haven't magically like figured out how to do that without people. Um, and that's why, you know, this is a company, um, you know, producing for like mall brands. You have these long rows of production lines of people. Um, and to make a shirt, it might be 50 people in a row, and it is somebody that is putting belt loop after belt loop after belt loop, and then these things, like right here, they put the garment on, they do their one piece, they put the, they put the garment back on, and it swishes forward. And they have targets for how many garments, like it, uh, they have industrial engineers that are on the floors, calculating the seconds that it takes each step, because every step, everybody has to be working as a, an orchestra. Every step has to be matched so that there isn't hang-ups of those um, swishing things. And that is kind of, when we think about the industrial engineering that has happened, it's turning these people into a spreadsheet. And that's really, when we think about not just the pay and the working conditions, speaking to garment workers about really the inhumanity of being reduced to that number. That's kind of the, the challenge of this industry, our industry that I'm a part of, is really seeing the humanity of that. And I got to speak to two garment workers, and I, you know, you know, kind of getting into this, I would naively ask, like, what do you think about? You know, I, I haven't had to do much manual labor in my life. What are you thinking about? Um, and I remember the first woman that I spoke to, and she was just like, it was through a translator, and she seemed really confused. And I was like, How, mm, what's happening with the translation? And, um, and then there was some back and forth, and she's, the, the response back was like, I'm not thinking about anything. I'm thinking about, like, go faster, don't make a mistake. Go faster, don't make a mistake. Go faster, don't make a mistake. And that is the only thought that can capture her attention. She says, and whenever I do drift off to the stresses, like, I will make a mistake and I will, you know, something bad is going to happen to me. And I think on the human level that this doesn't have to be the way that we do production. Um, and I think getting back that humanity, that these are human beings with real, you know, full selves, um, that these things don't have to be marked by the second and industrial engineered. And why the... the, the um, history of slavery becomes so important is that this industrial engineering, um, which fulfillment centers in the United States also use the same industrial engineering, um, began and got its start um, in, on slave plantations in the South. It is the same type of, of mechanized labor that we're, that we're utilizing um, in the kind of worst instances in this industry. Um, I think that the thing to understand about how this happened, and again, this, it's not all doom and gloom. There are companies, companies based in Minnesota that are trying, you know, that are trying to really seriously work on these issues. But it's that from, from uh, my parents' generation, from the 1960s, in the 1960s, 95% of clothing that Americans wore was American-made. Today, that's less than 2%. And in that shift, that massive shift that's happened, the, what, what a brand is has entirely changed. Brands used to come like out of factories, right? It was factories showing off their brand. Brands were created from factories. 
And we've moved all of that to now we, they, there isn't any production, it's you know, just the marketing and, and for some brands it's the design, for many brands it's the design. But we've outsourced all of that and in so doing, I think it was an unintended consequence for sure, um, but it's had a massive, um, a massive consequence and I think that kind of the work of the next decade and there are people doing really important work in these brands trying to kind of fix that, that challenge. So one of the, the kind of detailing, the getting in the, a little bit in the weeds on this is this, um, in, in shifting production, so brands no longer producing themselves, and in shifting the, this vendor code of conduct has been the way in which brands have been able um, to verify um, that companies that they work with, the suppliers that they work with, the factories that they work with, are, um, that have standards, right? And so a, a company will say, this is our code of conduct. We, um, if you are working with us, you have to um, pay you know, the legal wages and a whole host of things. But what's happening in the industry and, and the step that needs to be taken in this space is those um, codes of conduct get audited, um, but the audits are just staying inside the company. So it's, they're not being made public. And when we speak to the factory owners, we're hearing, well, even if we make our upgrades and invest in the upgrades and in doing the right thing, we're not hearing from brands that they will <clears throat> um, give us any benefit. So we're not penalized for not doing, um, we're kind of penalized for doing the right thing because it costs us more. And so these are the kind of practical steps that we can take, make these, um, these audits public to create the incentives for companies to um, help their factories and to move on from the factories if they continue to be out of compliance. But really shifting the conversation of it's on the factory to what is the brand's relationship with the factory um, to doing the right thing. And I have to say, none of this is straightforward. It's not easy. It's not like evil brand, like great factory or like evil factory, great brand. It's really the challenge in the two and shifting the system that we've had of being kind of completely like not knowledgeable about what's happening in the factories and just getting the benefit of a low price to understanding and creating the right systems in place so that there are mechani mechanisms, excuse me, <clears throat> for doing the right thing. <clears throat> I'll skip. So um, retail and consumption. So this is, you know, I think a, a theme that I've been talking about um, you know, this whole time, but um, it's, it's really this complete shift that we've had in a generation and continue to have with TikTok and social media and with influencer and influ the influencer economy. Like, all of these systems um, are now interacting with each other where there's so much social pressure. And I get, you know, well, I get sort of feedback from brands, well, consumers don't care. How can you say that consumers don't care when there's so much money and, and the social pressures, especially when you're a young, young person, attached with social media to consume these things. Um, and so I think that is, on a kind of meta level, something that we have to really recognize um, are the, the shifts and the different powers that are keeping this um, disposable relationship in place. Not just keeping it, but making it even more accelerated. There are companies, you know, first it was H&M and Zara. Now they are considered like moderately slow and it's Shein and Boohoo like where it is cheaper you know to get a Starbucks than it is to get a dress that's the type of thing and, and where you see young people now surveys are coming out that if they are found wearing a third of this was in the UK where they actually do some surveying a third of young people are saying that they will they of young women are seeing clothing as old if they've worn it more than once or twice Exactly the reaction I wanted. <laughs> um, okay, this sort of just um, breaking down the, the green wishing here. There's this big trend in circularity, which matters and is important and should be something in terms of systems that we should be striving for. You know, circularity is, as we know, like reuse, reduce, recycle. But what's happening is kind of the unintended consequence of that 
is a real focus on recycling systems that are either non-existent um, and, and not getting to like the hard work of how do we reduce our carbon? How do we slow down the system? And instead kind of focusing our attention on this like ephemera thing that is not possible um, at this moment. And, and I think also what it does is it's that same thing of, you know, there's no such thing as sustainable fashion. The, the, um, recy the recycled fiber technologies that are around today, and we should invest in all of those recycling technologies. That's not to say we shouldn't invest in innovation. We need much more money and innovation in, that, in this space. But the, the degree to which they're reducing their impact on carbon, on chemicals, on labor, is actually is minimal. And so the most, the, by far, the most powerful thing that we can do is to wear and love our garments more. <laughs> that was not so funny. <laughs> um, okay, one kind of just, we're going to go through all of the, the major, major hits here. We're seeing a lot of talk about being carbon neutral, and which is a great aspiration. We want, you know, the only systems that we um, can can survive off of on this planet is if we are being carbon neutral. But the, the problem, and again, this is um, not to blame the industry, it sort of has been an unfolding issue, um, is that um, it's a great aspiration, but, um, and sorry, I should back up. Being carbon neutral is meaning that there's net zero carbon emissions. So that means that a company is removing the same amount of carbon dioxide it emits, or carbon dioxide equivalents, if we're being technical, um, as, it, as it emits into the atmosphere. So we're at a neutral state. Okay, there are two ways that a company could do this. They could either go into their supply chain and reduce their carbon. They could focus on their uh, textile facilities. They could do the work of helping those facilities um, make energy efficiency improvements. Um, they could help them invest in um, green technologies so that they are uh, green energy systems, excuse me. Um, or they could do nothing with that and go on the carbon market um, and buy offsets. So that's what a lot of companies have done. Again, not, they're not trying to do something bad, um, but what we're finding, and a carbon offset, again, is an, an action or activity such as planting trees or investing in a wind farm that compensates for the emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. A lot of it is in um, farming or um, maintaining trees. Um, but this is what the, the problem that is coming out in this is that the carbon offset market is really corrupt at the moment. And so what's happening is companies think that they are doing the right thing. They're buying the carbon offsets. They've done the calculations of their carbon emissions and they're buying the offsets. But in reality, it's like funny accounting. And the planet doesn't care about creative accounting. The planet only cares about what's actually being drawn down. <clears throat> so, now, we've covered, have our clothing, we've worn it, we're getting rid of it. Um, depending, we're, how many times, depending on who we are and our relationship to clothing. Um, so in the U.S., of the clothing and textiles we get rid of, we throw away over 80% and we donate or resell the rest. This is about 80 pounds of textiles thrown out per person per year. <clears throat> this is a picture I took in um, Accra in Ghana. I was no longer pregnant. Um, uh, and what you're seeing, the clouds behind there, um, the smoke clouds, is this landfill was on fire. Um, and by the time I was exploring this landfill and it was on fire and I ran down um, because I thought that was a dumb way to die. Um, by the time I left, the, a week later, that entire landfill was burned to the ground. Now, why was I exploring a landfill in Accra? When we throw out our clothes, um, that's usually going to go into a landfill. I haven't looked exactly what happens in landfills. Um, our, waste in Minnesota, but by and large in the United States, do you have knowledge of this? Yeah. Sounds like it's great. <laughs> um, uh, largely in the States, we're sending things to landfills. Sometimes we're doing waste um, to energy, which just means we're burning it um, to create energy. Um, but a kind of a landfill um, is best described, it was described to me as a, as a big diaper. 
where there's a, yeah, yeah, great, excellent, so far so good, um, <laughs> where there's a, a kind of plastic sheeting at the bottom and then it's all filled up um, and after 20 years, 40 years, okay, then it like gets filled up um, or covered, covered up. Um, that is a landfill, a landfill situation in an um, organized environment. When we donate our clothes or take, give them to take back programs at brands. So I thought when I was going into this that like, it finds a happy home and it's great and it's lovely and we can all feel really good about it. Um, and we get a tax deduction, it's great. When we donate our clothes, do I have the statistic in here? I think it is 6% um, of the clothing. So let's put it the other way. 94% of the clothing that we are, I did the math, right? 94% um, of the clothing that we are donating does not get sold in by the donation facility. They do not find a home for it there. So what happens? You go to Salvation Army, they will give you about five weeks. If you are a thrifter, you know that system very well, the color-coded tags. Um, if it does not, first of all, a big portion of the clothing that is donated, it never even makes it onto the Salvation Army floor because it's not even high enough quality. Um, but if after those five weeks, again, 96%, um, 94, 96, I forgot now, um, is going to be bailed up and it gets sold by the bail, by pound, um, to sorting facilities um, who then sort it out and it then gets bailed up again. And um, that is why I was in Accra, because those bales, especially um, in Europe, there's also our bales go to places like Chile or Winter Coast to Eastern Europe, um, but um, our um, bales end up in the global south. Um, and what is happening is as clothing has become cheaper and lower quality, all of that waste is ending up in the global south and we're not finding a home for it there either. And so it is basically exporting our trash to countries that have less capacity to do it. And so that was why um, this happened, because this was a Tema landfill, the landfill that services the secondhand clothing market. And they created a landfill that was supposed to last for something like 12 years, and it got filled up in six years because of this, this partially because of the stream of clothing. And so all the safety measures, they were supposed to have, um, the landfill was supposed to be separated into four quadrants, so that if something happened like coal that was still burning happened to get into the waste stream, that if an emergency happened in one portion of it, it wouldn't extend to the other. But all of that had been filled up because there wasn't the capacity. And so that was why the entire landfill ended up burning down. Um, then resale is another market that is picked up, which is great. It's exciting. It's growing really fast. Um, the only fully supported. The only thing to just keep in mind is that what is happening in the resale market is that um, it's um, like the, the research around it is um, not around clothing, but something around bathrooms. And they, um, there was research that was done that if you put a recycling sign in a bathroom next to the paper towel and you do a study using um, how much paper towel is used in that um, place where there's a recycling sign and paper towel that is the paper towel used in a bathroom that doesn't have the recycling sign. I don't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but much more paper towel was used in the facility that had the recycling sign because people thought that it, you know, there was no consequence to it. And so as we celebrate very much, we should celebrate resale, we have to just keep in mind to not move systems of just speeding up consumption because we think like, oh, well now I can just resell it, so it's fine. There's no like consequence. Okay, now I've like depressed everybody. Um, and, <laughs> um, and now I just wanted to spend some time um, talking about what can be done, because there's so much that can be done. And I think that's really the exciting work ahead. The next five years is really investing and figuring out the systems to move to a different place. Um, and that's the work that um, we're doing at the New Standard Institute. It's what I describe um, in, um, in my book. Um, and um, and so here's a few things just to, to leave you with, and then happy to, to um, take any questions. Is first, our personal relationship with clothing. This is not to say you should feel guilty about buying clothing, or you should feel guilty about 
liking clothes. Like it's an invitation to actually love your clothing. It's an invitation to build a relationship with your wardrobe. And that's honestly the journey that I went on. Like I went off to New York to college and like H&M had just opened and I was super excited and I was buying all this crap. And I had a, um, a like small New York closet that was always overflowing with clothing. And I was like, why? I have so much stuff. Why do I never have anything to wear? And it was because I just completely lost any relationship I actually had with clothes. And so I think that in terms of what people can do, yes, like look out for the companies that are doing the work on sustainability. Yes, that matters. But build that relationship where you like your clothing again. Because that's like... You will see, like, don't Google image me, but like, I will be wearing this in most pictures. Like, I, if, if once you know the things that you're comfortable with, you, you know, you can feel good about it. Um, so that's just on the the personal relationship. The 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 second thing is to engage with companies, ask them what they're doing. The more that they're asked, the more that they're going to engage on this. Um, and then finally, I think this is the um, this last um, actonfashion.org is these solutions aren't, are going to require us, but they're re going to require us acting as citizens, not just as consumers. It's not just about, yes, it is about what company you're purchasing from, but we need to shift the systems here. Um, and we've um, introduced a, a bill in, um, in New York um, a month ago, less than that, um, that is working on addressing those system changes. And it's been exciting to see that this bill language has been picked up in places like um, Massachusetts and Washington. And wouldn't it be exciting if it was picked up in Minnesota? Because this is, these are the systems that we need to have in place, the rules that we need to have in place to create the incentives for companies um, to all invest, you know, and, and not make it that one company who is investing is at a competitive disadvantage for doing so. So I think that's kind of the... Um, the spirit in which I wanted to just end the, the formal remarks is we, and now being in the political process, I just see how much individual action actually matters a whole lot. Calling your representative, speaking to them, engaging on that subject, these, these ultimately are about individuals who want to be doing the right thing, who want to be engaged, and we have a, a lot more power than I think, certainly um, I was raised to believe. So I'm incredibly, I don't want to say hopeful, because there's, I think there's, there is just technically so much that can be done, and we really can address these things. It's a matter of actually making that happen, and that's the part that I can be hopeful for. So thank you so much, and excited for any questions. Reduced to be in line with the Paris Agreement. 
So it can, it's, a, it's a domestic law, but that has reached to places like China, to places like Vietnam. So um, yeah, like yes, would you want the UN if they actually have the capacity, which they don't have the capability of like, creating a global law? Yes, is that gonna happen? No, are there things that we can do before that that really do move the needle? Yes, is it also, is it only political and like doesn't matter what, how your own relationship? No, I think all of these things play into each other. And it also, like, I think this, um, I hope this isn't overwhelming. It shouldn't be. This is not something like tonight you have to figure it all out and you are the only one responsible. Like, there are organizations, there are, you know, people that are involved that are, you know, building this capacity um, to do this work. And so it's really getting involved in those organizations, learning more and, and yeah, committing to being part of the process. But it's not like, oh, shit. Oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> um, um, you know, I need to do everything perfectly right now. It's going to be, my husband's laughing, sorry. Um, it's, it's, um, going to be, it's, going to, it's going to be a lot of imperfect people um, doing their part. And I am one of those imperfect people. Yes. Yeah. Go. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, so, I, this is probably a way oversimplified question, no, and this um, is probably a bit unfair. But given all the things that you have said uh, in terms of the process of making a garment, what is the true value of a garment? So, let's, I mean, if you like say in like a, your classic tri blend t shirt, what is the true value of, of that piece of clothing? Like, what is the true cost of it? Yeah. Like, what, what's, what's the amount of not that it's all about what we're paying, but what's the amount that is reasonable to ask, taking into account everything that happens in terms of the production, I mean, the whole thing. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and these aren't, it's not an oversimplified question, it's a great <clears throat> question. And it's the question that we should be asking, we should be asking of our system. What I can say is there has been um, research that came out of Sweden that was looking at what would it take for, um, uh, I think they were looking at H&M, so Sweden. Um, uh, what would it cost a garment um, uh, if the garment workers were receiving a living wage? And it was something like 10 cents more. And this is also assuming, I mean, uh, the owners of H&M are some of the wealthiest people on the planet. So that's not even like taking into account like who within the business like makes the money. Um, it like so. Yes, it would mean like. Um, that our shirts should not cost like 99 cents, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be demonstrably, like, significantly more expensive. Um, and, I, but I, I think the key question is the one that you asked, is like, what should this cost? And how can we create systems um, so that those, those, those um, human and environmental costs are baked in um, and we're considering that um, in our purchase? Great question. Yeah, sorry, you're right next door. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so you, you tried to be really thoughtful about how you're purchasing clothing. You purchased second hand, you mended it when it, um, you know, with a hole in it. You cut it into rags um, when it's half of the components. When the rags get holes in them, you can no longer use them in that way. What is the best way to dispose of it? That's a, that's a good question. So, um, oh, sure, sure. So the question is like, You've done everything you can. The useful life of the garment is no longer. Um, if it's truly a rag, um, what would happen if you donated it um, is if they can't find a use, it, it would go into the waste stream. Um, and there is, like, if you have done that and the world moves to that system, like, you know, there will be a space for waste. <laughs> um, that would be a lovely world in which people are truly utilizing it to um, to to that end. I always default to um, donating a garment, not because I think it's going to find some magical second home, but at least it's inserting it into the waste stream that is sorting that out. Um, so that is what I tend to do. Yes.
but we always look for the food industry as being ahead of the fashion industry on that. Um, but I think, you know, what I've been really excited about is like people care about like this is like ten years ago this would not be a falafel audience. And my husband was telling me that before, like the level of care that has happened in the past ten years, in the past two years, in the past six months, like is really increasing. And I think the um, what we see is like the regenerative agriculture space. Like even when I was doing research for research for the book, so when I was in Texas. Um, that was like four years ago, maybe. Um, and the regenerative conversation was su like it wasn't new. Nobody talked. Nobody had that vocabulary. Regenerative agriculture um, is um, looking at agricultural systems like holistically. So you know, I said how the organic standard is about not using synthetic chemicals, but um, the organic standard actually doesn't take into account um, like carbon emissions. Um, from from agriculture, which regenerative agriculture, and then now regenerative systems really take into account. So I think people are moving there, you know, in that space. Um, and this isn't, I don't think, super helpful, but I always just try to ask questions. If people, like, are getting too technical with me, I'm just like, please describe this to me as if I'm nine. You know, and I, that's how I understand things, and I think that's how we all understand things. So. Um, I think people care when it's like made in the plainest language and then connecting it to a story. I know that's like, I should probably be more helpful than I am being, but that's <laughs> Yes? So there's um, rental, okay, so there was like a controversial study that I feel like deep in this stuff um, that came out and it was um, looking at a pair of jeans and it found that rental um, was actually worse than um, like the, the standard. Um, and there was a big hoopla because there's a whole bunch of assumptions like baked into like how many times that was rented, what was the distance traveled to rent it, um, what was the the, um, the useful life of that garment in the in the other scenario? So the long and short of it is the data isn't clear. It's very new days. You know the concept came out and the business community like invested in the concept and now it's really a matter of like understanding the data of how those rental systems actually like what they're actually doing. Um, and I can say. And this isn't because there's no data, so I'm not like basing this off of like um, consensus science, but I use rental for like special occasion things, things that I don't think I'm going to wear very often. I'm not using rental for like my day-to-day -day stuff um, because I would think that if I am going to wear the garment many, many times, that's gonna net out to be better. I'd like more data to be able to respond um, in more scientific terms, but that's where we are kind of in our understanding right now. Yes? Um, could you comment on um, places like our new Fisher and their particular clothing there, and whether that's just another thing? So I happen to know intimately the Eileen Fisher system, um, and what I can say is like they are, companies really are trying to figure this out, yeah. and um, it's hard. It's super hard. Um, they are not a perfect system. None of the systems are perfect. Um, but I think they're um, a, like they should get an A for effort, and not. And I don't mean that in a diminishing way at all. Um, I think they're it's they're really trying. You know, and companies that are working in this space are really trying to conceptualize. Like, you know, if we think about what this next five years are going to have to look like in the systems change, they really are thinking about that. Um, so it's not perfect. There's a bunch of like piles of stuff that they don't know what to do with. But they all they're also you know like reworking and really they you know trying to figure it out. So it's a journey, but um, I think it's a commendable one. They say they reuse the fibers, but you know I wondered if they did it in the mind. So I think so. Um, uh, that company is really trying to think through. So the the problem, the big challenge in the industry overall 
is that once you've had a blended fiber, so once you've mixed like your cotton and your polyester, it's uh, hard to unwind that. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but um, companies like Eileen Fisher are really trying to think, okay, what if we think about this on the design phase and are only using you know, single, um, single fiber um, products? Um, and that's kind of how they're um, figuring things out. But, you know, like, um, it becomes quite um, technical because, like, once you've had the dark garments, you can't, like, make it lighter. So then those things end up getting, like, darker and darker. Um, it's not that these are insurmountable, I don't think, um, but they're real-world challenges, and they are, you know, Iron Fish is a company in the weeds trying to figure it out. So there are like coordinating bodies in which brands um, work together on some of these issues. The reason why we have gone a legislative front is like we are finding that because there isn't any additional external pressure to actually um, shift in, a, in an environment in which especially the public companies um, are still um, beholden to shareholders that are thinking in short term um, in short terms. Um, the, the, the profit maximizing incentive just tends to outweigh any um, utilizing those um, organizing bodies in constructive ways, I'll say. Or it's a constructive, but it's very, very slow. Um, and so that's why um, with this piece of legislation, it's kind of kickstarting that because it just, it, it um, from a um, CFO of a company perspective, I don't have to be convinced that my sustainability team is going to use the money to increase profits in some way, which is how sustainability teams are still having to argue. Um, it will just be like, oh, my sustainability team need that money because I have to be in compliance with this law. Um, and so that's the kind of systems thinking that has led us to legislation as a component of this broader solution. Yeah, so there's a disclosure requirement in the bill of how much material is actually being used on the front end. It's not something we know. Um, the beverage industry, they have, uh, there's been enough pressure that the like the Coca-Cola's now disclose how much, how many bottles they're producing every year. Like in the beginning of my talk, I said 100 million pieces of, 100 million garments. Like that is from one thing MIT said 20 years ago, 15 years ago. We don't have like good clear data on just how much material is being used. So, so hang on, I'm, the, sorry. The, the front end is really important. If we don't know like the scale, then we don't know anything. 
Um, like they could say like, oh, we're saving this much, but we don't know like what the beginning pile is. Um, so there is a disclosure requirement of the materials, and then there's now discussion within, legis within the legislators of um, kind of, well, already in the bill is how much of that is being displaced by recycled materials, but then discussion also of including like the waste end as well. How much time do I have? Sorry, I don't, mm -hmm. I, I do want to see. 638. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yes. Like it is like that's the thing, right? Like it's this is very much cultural culture driven, and then it's like culture and like extreme capitalism combined. So we have like it's not it's the fashion in like bad players in the fashion industry, but then it's like super powered by the incentives of social media because like who do they get advertising dollars but from the fashion industry? And then it's like these technologies to warp people's attention so that they want to buy these things. And then you also, like, not, like, also um, complicit in this is, um, like, is Hollywood. Because what you, you know, don't realize is, and they don't realize, I think, is like, um, especially for women who get paid less, um, that they end up getting, like, if, if you see a, a celebrity as a business, a portion of that is how much they're making on movies, but if they're really successful, it's that they're getting brand deals. Um, and so it all does play into each other, but what is super exciting, I think, and hopeful with Gen Z is like, what is the term, Squish, what is this term? Squishy, squashy, whatever, I'm so not cool. Um, swishy? That one. Shoot, 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 Sorry, I'm so, so not cool. I'm a, what is it, a super old millennial? Uh, yeah, a geriatric, geriatric yeah. millennial, that's me. Um, but it's chuggy. Um, okay, it's not cool to not, that's the bottom line. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. And that's like the culture, the, yeah, sorry, I completely derailed this conversation. Um, it's, it's like in the young generation, it's very, like the, the there is this, there's a whole, like, not saying that, like, super duper fast fashion isn't happening with young people, but there's also a whole cultural current and young, emerging, interesting designers that are really trying to think about, um, about these new systems. And that does have to play a role. I don't, I'm not gonna, um, I think it's gonna come from um, culture, like, driving that and then the industry will will follow. I think it's um, it's communicating that with brands too. Like you have a you know like emailing, tw tweeting at them. Like it, it matters. Like you think it doesn't matter. Like they this makes their makes its way 
Um, and so that is really, you know, very important. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the um, Fashion Act um, that we're advancing is, on, um, is, is doing a couple of things. It's requiring that the audits, so the audits that at least ensure that minimum wage is paid, because in the industry, um, the research that has come out is that uh, on average, um, garment workers are not even, forget living wage, which is like that you could eat, have education, have some minimal free time. Um, the legal minimum wage in these countries are by on average not being paid. Um, and so the, like part of it is um, airing this information to create the right um, incentives for the companies to actually address these issues. So it's requiring that these audits would actually be disclosed so we know, the industry can know what's actually happening behind the scenes um, and know kind of creating then the market incentives for companies to, like what, what we have found is speaking to, you know, as I was saying already, is like a, a textile mill will say, we want to do the right thing, right? But where there's no incentive in, in place. And so if we start disclosing that those audits, then companies are uh, much more inclined um, to go and do the right thing. And likewise, um, there's a disclosure requirement on um, wages and how the wages that they are seeing compared to the minimum wage and to the living wage. And so that will, you know, really kickstart um, work in that regard. Um, and that's the sort of work that needs to happen um, in order to move to this place where the average company is not even um, paying the legal minimum wage to a, a much more hopeful space. Yeah. I'm wondering if, um, if production in the global north has a better track record, you know, or if there are brands recently or for a long time now have been walking the line of, of macrofibers and, and uh, compensated uh, workers, etc. So is, or are there businesses beginning to move back to the global north? Yeah, so it's a, so all of this stuff ends up like you talk about clothes, you under, like understand the world, right? Um, and and what I think is like none of these. This is hard stuff, and there's not like I don't think anybody knows the exact answer, right? How do we move into a, a global system that where there are jobs, but those jobs are fairly paid um, and compensated? Um, and we can exist within the bounds of the planet. Like, that's the challenge of the next five and ten years. Um, and, um, and, and it's not an easy one. And, I, and I, I'm the first, I think, to, to, to not suggest I have, like, this is the silver bullet. Um, I think that, um, you know, as I talked about before, there has been um, a lot of jobs um, lost particularly in the garment sector because it's so um, mobile and not expensive to set up. Um, I don't know, like, what I say is the answer to relocate that um, in the global north. I don't know if that is or is not the answer. What I can say is, like, people tend to think that shipping has a big carbon footprint. In the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't. Um, so it's, I don't, like, I think we could have a global system. I think. I do think that systems that are thinking more locally are interesting and um, to be explored um, and you know invested in and thought more about, um, and will certainly um, play you know play a role in in this future that we need to, to find ourselves in. I think we do have to. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.